We are almost everyone here. So, hello everyone. Good afternoon to the second panel discussion on green agenda in the Western Balkans of the Civil Society Forum ahead of the Berlin process on the issue of climate change and environmentally sustainable development. My name is Katja Giebel. I work for Heinrich Böll Foundation Berlin in the Department of East and Southeastern Europe. I'm associated with our offices in the Western Balkans, in Sarajevo, Belgrade and Tirana. And not only in the region, but worldwide, our political foundation works relies heavily on civil society expertise. Uh, so I'm very pleased to share this panel and where we have the chance to push the civil society concerns and the recommendations of these two important working groups into the discussion with government deciders. Also, I'd like to express my gratitude to the colleagues of the Southeast Europe Association and the Aspen Institute for realizing these packed and very participative, participative two days of conference in such a good way. Thank you for this good occasion. So let me introduce briefly our distinguished panel guests. I would like to start with our online speakers. With us uh, today is the Vice Minister of the Ministry of Tourism and Environment of the Republic of Albania, Ms. Almira Jambula. Ms. Jambula was appointed last October as Deputy Minister and before she was a Member of Parliament for the Socialist Party in the Dibra County. And before, from 2012, she worked as an advisor for advocacy and gender at an international Dutch-based environmental organization. Warm welcome and regards to Tirana. Also with us today online is uh, Ms. Teodora Grincharovska, who is the state councillor on climate change, change for the Ministry of Environment and Physical Planning for the Republic of North Macedonia. Ms. Grincharovska holds a PhD on technical sciences and she has uh, 20 years experience in the field of climate change and is uh, the, coordinate, the national coordinator and expert of various uh, climate change related working groups. Great to have you with us and our regards to North Macedonia. Also online as the third um, online guest uh, is Frozina Antonovska. An environmental lawyer, she is uh, the energy and climate policy officer for Western Balkans for the CAN, uh, for the Climate Action Network in uh, for Europe. So our regards to Brussels. Also, we are very glad to have you here, Frozina. And here in Berlin, I welcome to my right side uh, Ms. Ifeta Smajic, who is a social development specialist in the World Bank's Social Inclusion and Sustainability Unit for Europe and the Central Asia region. Uh, Ms. Smajic is leading several World Bank initiatives on stakeholder engagement in the context of green growth uh, for the Western Balkans. And to her right, I welcome Stefan Mager, a political scientist who joined the GIZ already in 2008, and he is managing currently a project in Kosovo on waste management and circular economy. And also, um, currently, he's developing a project for implementing the Green Agenda in the Western Balkans. So last but not least, I want to introduce our most important protagonists who are representing the results of the working groups um, they facilitated. Um, on my far right, I welcome Rino Vionora Goyani, who facilitated the climate change group. Uh, Rinora is the Programs and Operations Manager at the Balkan Green Foundation based in Pristina and she has an extensive working experience and knowledge in research, advocacy, civic and grassroots level engagement and she's focusing on sustainable development, um, energy policies and climate change. And uh, also uh, representing the working group um, for environmentally sustainable development, I welcome Endri Hajirai, who is the acting executive director at the Institute for Environmental Policy for Albania. Also, he is a European Climate Pact ambassador and for more than 10 years he's into climate activism and 
public awareness raising. Um, also from me, before we start, one last note on our format. As it was before, we practiced this fishbowl concept here. So after our short discussion in our round, um, I would like to um, encourage you to join the discussion with taking this free seat. Um, yeah, but as I also learned that uh, Ms. Jambula from Tirana is with us only for half an hour, I would like to start the discussion right now. Um, and uh, yeah, let's begin with the recommendations of the Climate Change Working Group. So, Andrew, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I'm honored to participate in this forum and I find it as one of the most important tools how to influence and push the environment protection and climate action forward. In this regard, it is of great significance to present recommendations of Group C uh, to colleagues, decision makers and policy makers. Uh, CSOs uh, in Western Balkans still stand strong toward the protection of environment. To start with recommendations, the CSOs toward the CSOs uh, they demand that CSOs be more proactive in advocating and lobbying to policy change, build up transparent systems, aware how to reduce waste and pollution, provide expertise and perform the watchdog role, share data from air, uh, food, waste, water pollution through platforms, influence and put and put pressure on governments in regard of environment protection and sustainable development, strengthening the cooperation between CSOs. Then, uh, there, the CSOs demands government uh, to support participation of NGOs in all government decisions regarding nature conservation and biodiversity, to mention waste management, forest management, corruption and environmental crime. In this line, they demand also to consider including NGOs in developing projects, provide co-creation methodology, support Roma people to move from gray to green economy, to fund or to bring more funds for biodiversity protection. There is also demand for accelerating of court's decision in regard of environmental crime. Uh, one overall uh, suggestion or, or recommendation was the implementation of law, of law. Even we may have good laws in paper. Promote circular economy in co concrete acts to include, include them in the laws and our people. S to strengthen the horizontal communication between government bodies and their capacities. One overall, one main uh, recommendation was to give people the quality of life they seek while protecting the environment. And uh, perhaps this is also a driver for immigration in the case of pollution. Reforestation, reforestation and reforestation. Uh, it is a huge demand in our group. Promote citizen energy cooperatives and ban dirty power plants. Support sustainable agriculture at there as soon as possible to network of areas of special conserva conservation interest like Emerald Network, strengthening the cross boundary, cross -boundary co cooperation. Then the CSOs demand to the EU and member states to start uh, with previous civil society forum recommendation to be reconsidered then the EU should put pressure on Western Balkan governments to implement the Green Agenda with other functional mechanisms if necessary and involve all stakeholders. Support and cooperate with Western Balkan CSOs rather than the governments. Another point in this regard was that the uh, EU should also increase efforts and development instruments to intensify cooperation and communication platforms with civil society and citizens. Pro EU should promote also green agriculture without damage damaging the nature. Uh, 
should put more efforts to monitor the processes when handing over public of public services from EU to Western Balkan governments. But the CSOs have also two other domains for international bodies, one for the German government that they should make Bionet functional, a platform uh, of communication between uh, stakeholders, and for the Regional Cooperation Council that should engage more with CSOs, like the Biodiversity Action Plan they have uh, to implement. And uh, in this regard, for the uh, biggest aim, we have to implement the Green Agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so this, this was a very good uh, recap of all the results of the working group. Um, I'm not sure if Ms. Uh, Jambula is still with us. Yes, she is very good. So I suggest uh, we do not continue directly with the next working group results, but have a chance for all the speakers to comment and respond to what we just heard. Um, I mean, I must say, yeah, what we was just what we just were about to hear already uh, was not entirely new, as uh, some of also this year's recommendations. Our ongoing concerns for many years who just had not been implemented so far. So I would like to start the discussion and your responses also with um, addressing the question, what to, needs to be changed in order to involve uh, the public and CSOs more in environmental decision-making processes? And as we heard, um, the obligation to include CSOs as equal partners already exist in, in different laws concerning the environment, the circular economy, the national climate plans, but yet it's not happening. Yeah? So what is your approach? Is how to ensure civil society organizations involvement through the Berlin process? Um, let's, let's start with Ms. Jambula. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure, in fact, to be in this forum uh, who aims in a way to enhance the dialogue between civil society organizations and, and government. So uh, it is my pleasure to share some of uh, our, let's say, perception and uh, have into consideration also the comments shared and uh, mentioned already by Mr. Rajirai who is, I would like to say, is one of the most active civil society representatives here in Albania regarding environmental sector. So, uh, Ministry of Tourism and Environment in Albania considers civil society sector as an important uh, partners and uh, involving them, it is a necessary tool and uh, it is obligatory, in fact, uh, and we invite them always in the process of drafting uh, laws and uh, uh, when we develop strategies. So uh, we try always to invite them and to make them part of our decision making processes. Uh, for example, uh, we have been involved them in the, uh, in the preparation of national uh, strategy on climate change. Uh, during the revised uh, NDC 2021-2030, they were part of our consultation processes and uh, some uh, uh, young people representing youth organizations who were also part of the roundtables where uh, were foreseen measures for uh, addressing climate change. So, uh, in a way, uh, although I am aware that we have still uh, to improve, uh, we have been uh, involving them in some decision-making process already. And uh, I'm uh, convinced that uh, some of uh, the recommendations that uh, uh, Mr. Ajira sh shared, uh, we have been taking into consideration in some cases. Yes, I know that we have uh, maybe uh, to be even more proactive, but I, I think that... Uh, we, we have been very serious uh, on uh, addressing them and taking them into consideration. So uh, we have been also going in field visits with uh, some civil society organizations, seeing concretely what happens in the field, uh, involving them when we draft uh, laws or when we develop strategies. 
And uh, regarding our, let's say, uh, support in order to uh, achieve objectives of the European Union Green Deal, Albania, you know that signed two declarations at the Sofia summit in November 2020. The Western Balkan countries on the green agenda, as well as the creation of a common regional market, which aim to make the economy sustainable and climate natural by 2050 through a set of comprehensive political and financial initiatives and reforms. In fact, I have to say here that we are in a good uh, starting position for the Green Deal with a power sector fully based on carbon-free hydropower. Albania is a transit country for the top and hopes to increase the role of gas in the domestic energy mix as well. And uh, discussion on making the blow-up power plant operational and connecting it to gas uh, have still to be yet and doesn't have concrete results. In fact, the production of electricity from solar plants is also in the plan to begin. To, to fully realize the green transition, it is essential to use all available tools and put the right policies in place at national, regional and local levels. In this regard, recognizing the need to map out a pathway toward carbon neutrality by 2050, Albania will develop and adopt a long-term low greenhouse gas emission strategy. And when revising the actual national strategy on climate change that was based on the first NDC target emission reduction, in accordance with the provision of EU climate law, governance regulation and other elements uh, of the EU climate policy framework. These long-term strategies should be focused on decarbonization of the carbon-intensive sectors like energy and transport and to define economy-wide targets for emission reduction from all transport models, buildings, agriculture, industry and waste sectors, some of the sectors that were already mentioned in the uh, recommendations and the question raised by Mr. Hajirai. To reach climate neutrality by 2050, our commitment to reduce GHG emissions will go hand in hand with increasing carbon removals. In this regard, for the implementation of the SOFIA declaration on the green uh, agenda for the Western Balkans 2021-2030 20, uh, adoption of the decision of the Council of Ministers that will transpose regulation on the inclusion of greenhouse gas emission and removals from the land use change and forestry and its proper enforcement is one of the priorities for the climate sector. And uh, improvement of GG inventories, developing forestry management plans, adding new categories of carbon storage products, including harvest wood products, should be among the first steps toward this goal. And in addition to this, the LULU CF sector capacities to sequester carbon from the atmosphere, an integrated approach to climate action and a greater contribution from the land sector, including optimizing land use planning and practice is also urgently needed. So these are some of uh, the, let's say, our plans, our, let's say, strategies, and uh, when we can cooperate and involve and uh, enhance the dialogue with civil society. Thank you. Thank you so much for explaining these Albanian strategies and also for your participative uh, approaches. S still, I would like to make use um, of you as long as you are with us um, and, and, and pose one more specific question, um, also at the risk of not making myself popular. Um, I would like to know, um, as the Albanian government has agreed to make the Vyosa Valley a protected area, a national park, which is expected to happen next, uh, early next year, I guess. Um, quite contradictory to this decision uh, seems the construction of an airport in, in this land, in this protected area, um, that would actually destroy this part of the Vyosa Delta. So one quite famous Albanian uh, environmental organization, Pipinia, uh, opposes mm -hmm. in this in an open letter that is supported by many international and national NGOs. Um, and also there's media coverage like from Euronews and Reuters and Guardian on this topic. Um, 
And also the last progress report of the European Union uh, stated that the construction of the Vlora airport is a contradiction with national laws and international conventions on biodiversity protection that have already been ratified. So I would just uh, wonder and like to know why, uh, why is the Albanian government still silent in this issue? Yeah, thank you so much for, for your assessment on that. Yeah, thank you for your question. In fact, uh, uh, Albania government, also the, the Ministry of Tourism and Environment already has, uh, uh, let's say, stated their, I mean, our uh, official, uh, I mean, declaration on this, uh, this decision. But I would like to say that uh, during 2019-2021, uh, Albania uh, went through a assessment of a protected area system in, uh, and uh, this study examined all the protected area surface in Albania and analysis all the biodiversity value one by one of the 15 for existing sites and uh, all the possible stakeholders were met, uh, informed during the evaluation process led by an independent group of experts and also this decision and this assessment was done in line with ministries and state agencies were part uh, also. The revision uh, was done for several, let's say, reasons. Uh, many decisions were very old and not updated. There were no maps accompanying the decision which led to misinterpretation. There were more than 20,000 hectares difference between the existing decision maps and use for the areas and some other there were developments inside the territories that were not more ac acceptable for protected area at the end of the process the final proposal from the ministry of tourism and environment for a total surface of uh, protected area system in albania uh, was taken into consideration 90 percent of the same existing area and uh, increased in the total coverage from 18 to 21 percentage of the national territory and uh, Based on this two-year study, the area proposed for the development of the airport was removed from the territory of the protected area by decision of National Council of the Territory as the highest institution in the country for special planning. And it, it was done by decision number 10 of 28 December 2020 in accordance with Article 20.4 of the Loan Protected Area. So the airport project is proposed to be carried out on existing footprint of the former military airport, which was operational until the early uh, 70s. It is located in a sub area C, an area described for the traditional use. It is that it does not affect any natural moment or uh, monument or the Narta Lagoon, as it uh, said, where the favorite places of wintering birds are located outside the spot of the former airport and where the current project is expected to be built, there is also a salt pan. Despite this, uh, Napa remains committed and obliged to protect the landscape and the species present within the protected landscape. The developer has applied for an in-depth environmental impact assessment procedure and has gone through all consultation process requested as by Albania legislation. The environment declaration proposed by a national uh, environmental agency and approved by the minister contains a number of conditions that must be met by the project developed during the land preparation phase, during construction and during operation that will for sure be monitored by the Ministry of Tourism and Environment. It is also the duty of the developer that environmental consultation for biodiversity will be an integral part of the monitoring trend reporting on environmental components. And as presented uh, uh, in the in-depth uh, environmental impact assessment report and the environmental statement declaration, the measures that will be taken will significantly minimize the impact that the project may have on the area, while the ministry and the dependent institutions will take all necessary steps to guarantee the ecological integrity of the area. Uh, I have to mention here that there is no doubt that strategic importance of this airport for the development of tourism 
and economy and employment is, uh, I mean, uh, in Blora country. This airport would be a new pole of tourism that favors Albania, like, for example, Italians who built airports in Bari, Brindisi, the Greeks who built airports in Thessaloniki or Corfu, Ioniana and other North, North Macedonia who built airports in Skopje and Ohrid also, and uh, Montenegro who built the airport in Tivat. So as uh, tourism is identified one of our uh, strategic uh, sectors, we for sure uh, having into consideration all the facts and measures and uh, Albanian legislation, uh, it was, uh, we came, I mean, with this decision. So this is, uh, I was not prepared exactly maybe uh, to have uh, full, let's say, answer for this, but I hope I was clear enough to uh, uh, mention all the the base of legislation and the arguments that we have as ministry when we uh, approve this kind of decision. Thank, thank you for these uh, yeah, quite real, real political explanations. Um, maybe I can also ask Ms. Kantsarovska about her approach as how to ensure the uh, involvement of uh, public and civil society organizations in uh, environmental decision-making processes. Thank you, thank you for the invitation to be part of this uh, interesting discussion and uh, uh, to give us possibility to, to make some comments on the proposals or uh, recommendations made by your group. Uh, yes, you already mentioned at the beginning that um, I'm semi-scientist working in the administration. So from scientific point of view, it was actually the part of my PhD. There was clear evidence mathematically proved that there is a need for inclusion of, um, of different stakeholders from the very beginning of the planning of each step needed for wise policy making. What does it mean in, in, in reality? It means that we uh, as a country, so Macedonia, Kosovo, Albania, or others which are part of the Western Balkan, so-called Western Balkan countries, are facing at the same time with double challenge. From one side, we need to transpose European legislation into our legal system, which is top-down approach. And from the other side, we need to cope with, um, with the expectations from the society, from the whole society, from humans. Uh, because I'm state councillor on climate change and my specific point of uh, work is uh, climate change. So especially for, for climate change, it's very difficult to cope with the requirements arising from EU acquis and uh, with the expectations arising from uh, impacts or from other from other negative uh, negative impacts from on climate by by uh, or caused by by climate change. So what does it mean in practice? It uh, in practice it means that uh, we as a countries would need somehow to invest or to propose some hybrid systems on uh, coping at the same time with both expectations with the EU and with the citizens. And it means that we would need as governments to include uh, CSOs and business community and scientists at every and each stage of planning, preparation, uh, implementation, and further monitoring of implementation of all relevant strategic document at national and local level. And it did happen in my country. I can give you several examples. For example, uh, we have included CSOs uh, as uh, partners in steering committee, as a uh, steering committee members in the in the projects which were uh, implemented or financed by by the EU. We have published all our relevant data on the open data portal, which was run uh, by another ministry, Ministry of Informatic uh, Development. Uh, then we have programmed separate dimensions for inclusion of CSO within the programming of our future IPA instrument for pre-accession projects or projects supported by the EU, but not just from the EU, also projects supported by the UN. But I would like also to mention one fact, and I would be a little bit critical. In order to be involved 
the, the, the basic need is to have a knowledge and understanding. What does it mean? It means that we need also actions and reactions from the other side. It's not just up to the governments to involve CSOs in every process, in every step of policy making and policy implementation. It's also up to CSOs to know and to understand what is already developed. I can, I can refer to so many documents published already and available on our website, Klimatski Promeni MK. And I would be really happy if majority of CSO pass through documents, pass through recommendations, and when they develop some proposals to help us in the implementation of the policy section and measures which are already proposed based on scientific data. It is not a, a, a wish list. It is not, in our case, in Macedonian case, it was scientifically run pro, uh, process. We develop our and adopted all necessary documents for decarbonization. I'm sticking uh, to, to, to that component because I'm representing uh, that part of the, of the overall environment. Uh, so uh, let's finish and give uh, maybe time to, to other speakers to, to speak. There is a need for action from different sides, not just from the governmental side, but also from CSO sides. And the crucial is partnership. That's the crucial term, partnership and transparency. If we are like, liking some of, it, of them, whether it's transparency or it's partnership, we will, uh, we will lose the, the, the action. Climate and uh, appropriate addressing of environmental needs need uh, focus action by different stakeholders, but aiming to achieve one single goal. So I will stop here. Maybe I will continue uh, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Gonzanowska, for your explanation. I would suggest we continue now directly with the recommendations of the Climate Change Group, Renora facilitated. Thanks for your patience, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, all, because I think already an introduction, in a way, was made. Uh, but because um, all the topics that we're discussing, they're, they're interrelated, they're connected. In the previous panel, it was said we, uh, there were no recommendations about climate, whereas we have recommendations now. And I think it was really good for uh, decentralizing the green agenda on its own, because uh, if we would talk about the green agenda um, as a whole, then definitely it would be a long list. So uh, even the groups that were divided into the green agenda into three groups, I think it was a wise thing, because then we can keep governments, uh, we can hold them accountable for uh, re recommendations that we made, uh, and also they can uh, also report on their actions more easily. Um, and uh, for that, basically, um, climate, in a way, still didn't take the position it needs to take, uh, nor in the eyes of uh, governments, nor in the eyes of civil society. And this was seen also from the interest of civil society to be part of the groups that were sectorial, in a way, because it's more interesting to talk about EU integration as a whole, but EU integration will be reached when uh, specific legislations and specific sectors are fixed. Uh, and I would recommend, even for civil society, uh, to really look things from, um, as it was said, from the bottom up. Because from the top down, things are quite clear. We need to transpose them, and we are doing so, someone faster, someone slower. But in terms of uh, now action, uh, there is a need to have a specific focus. And in that, uh, I mean, we were very demanding about um, climate actions that are needed from the government. And for that, uh, we hear a lot of initiatives, but we don't hear a lot of initiatives that, are, that cooperate and communicate between Western Balkan countries. We are mentioning air pollution as a joint problem. We are mentioning uh, interconnectivity uh, and all other problems that need to be discussed uh, together. So that's a recommendation that countries, Western Balkan countries, need to uh, cooperate and communicate amongst each other. 
uh, it was said that uh, even civil society do not have information what documents are, are there. Uh, maybe this is a problem because there's no awareness raising from the governments to uh, transmit to the population and to civil society, what is out there? What is government working? So for that, there, are, there is important to have uh, joint awareness raising campaigns or even awareness raising campaigns individually per countries for sectorial policies. Let it be uh, air pollution, climate change mitigation, sustainable transportation, um, and also request from population and civil society and all stakeholders <clears throat> how they can contribute to uh, mitigate these problems. Uh, it was mentioned even in the first panel uh, that increase uh, of financing, climate financing is something that we don't see at the Western Balkan uh, countries and that is very important. This is also definitely linked with uh, sectors and we have divided that into energy, transport and green mobility and the third is the household sector because these three sectors are uh, the main pollutants, the main uh, um, sectors that emit most. Um, on the energy one, there's important to have um, to reduce barriers for renewable energy development. Uh, we hear a lot about one-stop shop would be good, but we don't see action. It's, I mean, most of the countries talk about it, but they, they never happened. Um, there's important to lower import taxes on solar panels. I mean, we have a good example on that. Albania has done it and other countries need to follow with it. Um, there's also important to develop concrete plans for coal phase out. We heard that there are institutions that support countries to do that, but we don't see a commitment. We don't see a date from, from countries. When it comes to transport and green mobility, um, I mean, during the winter and during the rush hours, we see how capitals mainly are transformed. So green mobility and uh, expanding public transportation networks is very important in order to make, um, in order to discourage the use of cars in the cities. I mean, there are tests uh, happening, uh, at least in Pristina, and there's a big debate about uh, was that a good thing or not. But um, I, I said, if one person gave up the next day when we were doing the testing, if they gave up from uh, turning on their car and using it, then the test was successful because um, they walked or uh, they used uh, public transportation. Um, then there is important uh, the connection of railway system um, to the EU railway grid and open new cross-border railway connections. Um, there were all those, let's say, capitals and cities mentioned that will uh, link Vdora Airport with other cities, but uh, I say uh, railways um, should be, should be um, the, the key word and uh, taking a lot of financing. Whereas regarding the stakeholder, um, the uh, household sector, um, the designing of national programs for energy efficiency, and here I want to re-mention uh, energy efficiency, energy efficiency, and programs about energy efficiency, because um, that definitely is um, a power. And uh, there's a need to um, give grants and subsidies in order to uh, support um, the household sector um, into transforming uh, their equipments, but as well uh, in transforming their, their buildings. Uh, a specific um, recommendation was uh, that countries of the Western Balkans need to uh, prepare for the European Carbon Bo uh, Border Adjustment Mechanism, CBAM as it's known, in order to uh, adopt their carbon pricing mechanism, because from this we might also benefit and we should think about that. If we are prepared as countries, we will absorb more money from the EU and from, um, I mean, even individual countries, um, part of the European Union and also 
for that, there is important to build climate partnerships. Uh, there is one program, we're in Germany, and there's one program uh, between um, Germany and Serbia um, about um, climate partnership. Um, but on that as well, there's a, there's a need for um, a monitoring of that. Is it producing results? Who is involved? And um, how, how is going? Does it need to continue or does it need to be stopped? because uh, only money being given without a certain follow-up, uh, it's, it's, it's not good, it's a loss of money. Um, and uh, one, I mean, I will mention just the main important ones. Um, uh, one sector that definitely needs um, a strong um, focus, it's to build the recycling and waste management sector. Um, and from that, we can learn a lot from Germany because Germany's recycling and waste management sector has been taking the lead in greenhouse gas emission reductions for decades, and I think we can learn about that. And I'm pretty sure um, um, GIZ is, is definitely given an, an example through their offices in the Western Balkans, but we really need to uh, grasp all that potential that, that is out there. To move to uh, recommendations for the EU and EU member states, um, I mentioned the climate partnerships, but um, we were very specific in saying that there should be an assessment mechanism to evaluate the progress of the partner country, to involve CSO's representatives in steering committee meetings that oversee the implementation of the partnership, not just telling results, but actually having them as stakeholders. And also make sure that in case of non-delivery, the partnership and financing transfers can be paused or even ended. Um, I mentioned the CBAM, but as, as a mechanism that can be a revolving thing that brings the benefit back to the country, uh, because that would then uh, increase support, it will bring technical assistance and transfer knowledge uh, in order to have a just, and I'll re-mention just, energy transition in the region. Um, also, uh, there's a important to push for implementation of EU gender action plan towards its pillar of the green transition and digitalization to ensure a fair and inclusive transition and acknowledge the key role of women in fighting climate change on the household level. Whereas the, uh, the last one for the EU is to support Western Balkan 6 to build new railways. I mean, if it's a priority of countries, we need support, and that can only be done with the support of EU and EU countries. Whereas for the civil society, um, there's needed to put, uh, we should put a stronger focus on following climate change. And I said there was no much interest about it, uh, so that is important to be increased. It is. Uh, we need to impl implement collaborative projects amongst, uh, amongst each other um, with multi-dimensional approach in order to um, tackle the impacts of climate change. Um, and in order to go to just the specific ones, there is important to create mechanism and tools for recording data and the progress made by institutions in fighting climate change and emissions in order to simplify information for the wider audience. I mean, there are uh, certain things what, that my organization, we started uh, in Kosovo with the support of uh, the World Bank, and I, I think uh, that can be mentioned, results of which we will see later on, but at least there is a focus, and maybe that can be uh, replicated from other countries as, uh, as well. Raising awareness is always important, uh, participation, definitely, uh, and also holding governments accountable for their commitment, including related to national legal frameworks, but also deriving from EU accession documents, which are binding for the Western Balkan countries. Um, yeah, and using legal tools, always. Uh, because that definitely brought results uh, in many cases, and that should continue. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Renora, and also Andrew, for this very precise uh, present presenting of the results of both working groups. I would like to directly following um, to ask for your responses of all other panel guests. Uh, maybe let's start with uh, Stefan Mager. As both uh, working groups pointed out, to promote the establishment of a circular economy in the Western Balkan region, also. Um, connected or adapted to, to the German system, what is adaptable and can be learned from Germany, from your part of, from your professional perspective? Yeah, thanks for, for inviting me to, to this panel uh, and uh, thank you very much for the recommendations. And I went through them thoroughly and have some comments, but happy to start with the one on the circular economy since I'm now for one and a half year uh, based in Pristina and working in, in waste and circular economy and uh, there <coughs> are two major things that we see uh, as EU best practice uh, and that is uh, um, the first is integrated waste management on regional level which we see in North Macedonia we see it uh, in, uh, in also now in, in Kosovo coming um, and um, there's a strong, and this is maybe something that needs to be incorporated into uh, to the recommendations too, there's a strong involvement of the municip municipalities yeah? and at the local level and the responsibility of the local level, especially in, in waste management and integrated waste management, is, is equally important as the central level. And maybe this is something that can be added in the, in the recommendations. Also for all the other topics, um, we've seen, for instance, in, in Kosovo, the, the Green Charter signed, uh, where the central government and the municipalities uh, look into how to implement, and implement the green agenda on the local level. Um, so this is regional integrated waste management is one thing, and um, the other one is um, the um, um, producer responsibility schemes. Um, we are working on introducing deposit refund systems, uh, as we know them from other countries in Europe, uh, and uh, I see a lot of appetite from the governments to have such schemes. Uh, and I think from these two perspectives, we can uh, tackle the issue of, uh, of waste and uh, go first steps into this big topic of, of circular economy. Um, now, if, if I may touch a little bit on, on some of those uh, things uh, that were mentioned and maybe starting with a general topic uh, or comment, that I also would like to make with regard to the previous panel. Um, being now for one and a half year in the Balkans, uh, I learned that uh, we will not have a green energy or not a, not a green, green transition as such if the major political problems of the region are not solved. Yeah? Because we need cooperation um, between the countries for energy, for biodiversity, um, even for circular economy, these, none of those pillars uh, and topics can be solved on a, on a national level. Um, now, cooperation needs trust, and we see a lot of lack of trust. Uh, and therefore, I'm very happy of the connection of the Berlin process uh, and the green topics, because without progress on the major political issues in the region, we will not see any green transformation. Um, now, um, Things that were mentioned, uh, the climate partnership uh, or the climate partnerships that are ongoing, um, we are a little bit involved there and hopefully, uh, as, as you recommend, uh, there will be something going beyond Serbia. Uh, involvement of CSOs is, I think, something uh, that uh, is well noted and should be brought in. What would be my comment here is, um, and I will also bring this in, uh, in, the, in on the German side on the discussion that the green agenda or the link to the EU green agenda should be stronger and the coordination of donors uh, is very much needed um, on those things. Also, um, one big topic, uh, just transition in, in your early um, um, recommendations here. Um, and we are, or at least I'm working for this for quite a while now, also in my previous assignments. And I learned uh, we should not push too much on always on these phase out things. Um, I think one of the major questions for the countries in the Balkans is what is the future industrial identity of the region? Mm -hmm. Tourism is one thing, we discussed it and this is already controversial, um, but also um, where is the value created um, with which you pay, for instance, renewable energies and so on and so on. Is it uh, IT, is it health? I'm very happy to read the, uh, the railway topic in, in the recommendation because this uh, whole question of transport can be one of the key drivers. Um, and um, I think also civil society maybe uh, can, can look a little 
little bit more into what is the future industrial identity of the region uh, to, uh, you know, to, to lower the fear that it's just about talking of, of losses. Uh, there's a lot to be gained. And also you mentioned data and IT and seeing all the young peoples in the Balkans uh, with much more strong affinity to, to digital things. I think there's a huge potential and this can be, can be taken up. Maybe last, uh, or, or maybe to close with a little critical comment also on, um, um, on no, not, not, not critical, but provocative comment on, on uh, civil society organizations. Um, I see that the civil society organizations are strongly donor-backed in the region, for good reasons, and, and this will continue. Um, but sometimes I ask myself, where is the society behind civil society organizations? Yeah? Um, how much is, are the topics we are discussing here really embedded in the society? I, I see very little awareness, and, and, and thanks for mentioning awareness raising. Um, we implement some uh, EU funds, and the EU is also much more putting emphasis now on awareness raising, because actually we see strong civil society organizations, uh, strongly backed by donors, but um, a real understanding in the society about the topics um, is maybe lacking. Maybe you, you know more, but because I'm too, too short in the region, but I think this is a topic uh, we need to look into, because that lacks, um, links back again to something we see on the other side that there is commitments of the governments with regard to donors. They, they signed the Soviet declaration and then they do very little yeah, because uh, their constituencies and the people that vote them have these topics not on their priority and this needs to change. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, maybe also the, your last note could relate to a question I would have to uh, Ms. Antonovska, to Frosina Antonovska, like building up knowledge on climate change and energy education and the corresponding impacts, like from your experiences, which campaigns could be successful? Yeah, what 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 could be needed more of in the, in the entire region, probably. Hi, good afternoon to everyone from my side and uh, thank you for inviting me to take part in this discussion and give some additional comments to the recommendations. Um, in order to say what we need more of, uh, I would like to start first with the different layers of work and public awareness and knowledge building that needs to be done. So listening to the recommendations and the way they're structured, uh, we need to emphasize the differentiation between public awareness raising and knowledge building because these two things are at different levels of capacity to influence or to trigger social shifts and, and change. So first we need the general awareness raising or informing and educating people about climate change, environmental protection, sustainability, to be influencing their attitudes, behaviors and beliefs towards minimizing pollution, global warming, as well as how economic development actually can be done and should be done. But it is even harder to build the knowledge of what the solutions are for this quicker, clean transition, which then should also be applied in the different roles we have in our lives, private or professional. Which leads me to the other differentiation that we also need to make, and that is who are we talking to? Citizens, officials and civil servants, media, or other civil society organizations, which, were, which was already mentioned. So these are all different layers of society to which we need to bring closer the topics that we work on. We have to bear in mind that often the topics that we work on are complex and niche. It is sometimes difficult to understand the details and the issues by even the people who are working in the field. Hence, our campaigns need to be longer. So that's a first. Uh, we need time. And second, we need to have different levels of engagement. Uh, we have seen a lot of work done by many different actors, but unfortunately it remains fragmented and uncoordinated, which results with limited outreach and, and success, of course. So another thing would be that we need to learn how to partner better, which was already mentioned. We need to find ways to amplify the work that we already do. And of course, we need to bear in mind that most of the time we seem to be talking to each other, which one could argue also about the case about what I'm doing now at the moment. So reality is that we put a lot of effort in creating our policy outputs, our campaigns, our recommendations, but not as much effort in the dissemination of the work done. And I'm going to use just one example on how these different layers and levels of work can be done, uh, and also how this approach requests specific efforts and time. I believe that everyone here today uh, is aware of the effect that coal has on the environment, air pollution, and health of the people in the Western Balkans. 
Also that the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions do come from the energy sector, do come from coal. For quite some time now, CSOs have been advocating for just transition. The energy community started some work. We hear politicians even mention this term in all of their speeches, which are related. However, when last year we decided to do a study on coal impacted community of Lazarevac, which is in Serbia, aiming to capture the bottom up perspective or the view from below of the problems, the needs, the desires of Lazarevac residents regarding key issues of energy and just transition, we were shocked by what the results were. So first, when it comes to Lazarevac residents, awareness of energy and just, just transition, the majority of respondents do not know what energy transition is. People don't want to talk about it on, on the field. People are scared. And people even consider just transition a taboo. Although they are aware of the various impacts of the environmental pollution of their local community, they complain about the lack and uh, lack of hard and statistical data concerning environmental pollution and protection. So people feel demotivated, discouraged, or simply not interested in getting involved more actively in the affairs of the local community. Activists and members of civil societies feel excluded, even on purpose, from the local decision-making process, and that frustrates the remaining dedicated residents and forces them to consider abandoning these efforts. So this is the first step in this example. We went on the field, we have a report, we have the facts. Now, what is the next step? We identify the audience. We say, okay, we need the general public to be aware. We need to simplify the message that means. So this is how we developed the comics called Energy Superheroes. Now there with a very simple presentation, we try to bring closer these taboo or complex topics to the people that do not understand but are very, very closely affected by it. But was that enough? Does everyone read comics? Does everyone use social media? So we said, let's go on the field again. Let's do something with them. And that is how we got into, into the idea to paint a mural uh, of the energy superheroes in a primary school in Serbia. So the students got involved in painting it. We used environmentally friendly special paint. Uh, we just launched an augmented reality app that will engage the students further. So we're trying to, to use their medium into checking it out and reading more on the energy transition. But is this work done? The media picked it up at the moment, is in the news in, in Serbia. It started a discussion, but we do need more work and we do need more time. We need to go and talk and explain to the teachers. We need to talk to the students. We need to maintain the discussion. And this is one example of how much time and effort just one segment takes. And I mentioned the media. The media is another stakeholder we need to work with. Media does not have time or capacity to report on all of these topics. This is why we also need to engage more and find ways in which we would support professional, independent, and investigative journalism, especially in this fast clickbait world we live in. And we need to use the opportunities we have, like this winter, we need to learn how to use crisis as an opportunity. Today, energy is the headline topic. Energy efficiency is a topic. Energy poverty made it to the daily news. We need to use this opportunity to give the solutions and make them known, to ask for solidarity, namely the acute help that needs to be done and the process of just transition we're lagging behind with, and we need to make sure pressure and responsibility on the government is put. And just to wrap this up, uh, many of the recommendations that we are discussing today are closely connected. We need the identified target groups in order to build this climate awareness. And we need to support the inclusion of wide spectrum of stakeholders. And for that, we need the centralized bottom-up approach involving local governments, companies, citizens, and their associations. We need to build the knowledge among all these stakeholders and even ourselves as CSOs and this should be done through formal and informal education, through cooperation and partnerships. Because without this coordinated and planned action, we cannot have informed participation. We cannot have the needed engagement and the pace by which we need to see the transition happening. Thanks a lot, Frozina, for these very precise, uh, concrete um, approaches on energy education energy education um, that is quite uh, needed to, to break taboos. I did not even know that uh, that you would call it like that. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I would like to uh, 
add one more question to Ms. Majic. Um, maybe it's a rather holistic question. Um, tackling, tackling one recommendation uh, Andrew uh, posed um, when, he, when, in, when, when one recommendation said, find approaches to environmental management that give people the quality of life they seek while protecting the env environmental system that are also the foundations of our well-being. So maybe also from your social risk assessment um, background, what, what incentives could come from all kind of actors, from the EU, also the member state governments, or also other think tanks, um, to, to better the environmental management that eventually also concludes then in a better standard of living. And in the end, I mean, to keep it a bit simple, but in the end also could turn people from leaving the area, yeah? Could um, keep people away from, from emigrating. Well, that is a very comprehensive question, but thank you first of all for having me here and um, for the group for their presentation of the recommendations, both from the climate change and environmental issues. I think that, you know, um, in terms of leaving, let me start with the end of the questions. I think that, um, especially for once, for all of, for the ones of us that are from the, looking from the outside, leaving, we cannot discuss that, and we sh should not discuss that because that's a very personal uh, question. But I think in terms of really the, the issues that have been discussed today, I will first like to comment a few issues that uh, Renora uh, mentioned in terms of uh, stakeholders' engagement, in terms of cl the climate change recommendations, and without diverging entirely from the questions, I would like to put um, maybe back to the, to the room also an issue that I didn't hear so much today, uh, which is climate change adaptation. And in terms of, you know, we, we've heard a lot about collaboration, we heard a lot about stakeholder engagement, but if there's one area that we really see a lack of coordination, a lack of collaboration, it's on, on, on disaster risk management. And given, you know, the size of this, the countries and the transboundary issues in terms of water security, in terms of water management, this is an area that I would like, you know, uh, maybe the group to consider um, adding on. Um, we at the World Bank also have a uh, regional project uh, with Bosnia-Herzegovina, Serbia, and um, Montenegro involved looking at strengthening uh, water, uh, cross-boundary water uh, collaboration. And I can tell you that, you know, we're, just in, we're starting implementation, but just from the first initial experience is that when we look at, for example, flood protection, it's, it's very easy for countries to go into the specifics and technicals and, you know, look into what needs to be done in terms of, you know, managing the flood, flood bed and things like that, embankments. But when we talk about dialogue and sharing of data on, on water resources, that's where things get a little bit more difficult. Um, and in terms of also, I would like to, because that is my area of expertise, the stakeholder engagement, and in terms of also what Mr. Meger said, and the role of uh, the civil society in the Western Balkans, what we see very often is that the civil society is holding the governments accountable and is very active and is very, very, very vocal. But what we're seeing the lack of is actually platforms for where citizens can engage directly. And I think that this is, you know, first, several panelists mentioned that there's, a, there's an issue with access to information, but access to information that citizens can actually digest, right, uh, in terms of using language that citizens can also point, uh, point to, you know, how can we make the environmental impacts assessments better? How can we make them actually more accessible so that the public consultations around them can actually be more meaningful? So. And that's one area. And then lack of spaces for citizens to actually engage. Um, and directly with government entities and, and those, let's say, responsible for the, for the plans, for the strategies. So uh, what also Renora mentioned um, initially was that we are working together on, you know, uh, in the framework of collaborative social accountability, which is, um, which, you know, how, sounds very rosy, but it, ha it is very practical in a way, uh, where... Uh, CSOs, 
together with uh, responsible government entities, are creating a platform which would be that one-stop shop for green agenda um, implementation in Kosovo. So, you know, putting together all the, all the information that the public needs in order to understand where are we currently standing on the green agenda issues. And then um, using that to start a dialogue on where are we actually lacking, where are we not doing so well, and having an open and transparent dialogue about that in a, in a, in a language, again, that the public can understand. And then the idea is to have an ask the state button or a feature which you can directly then pose questions to uh, the relevant government institutions where you would be, you know, the things that aren't clear, the things that don't seem to match, the things that, that you would like to understand more. So that kind of gives that entire circle of information, of, of research. Very often, several panelists talked about that. There is so much information available, but it's not it's not in one place, it's not available to the public very often. So, um, so one of the things that in this whole process, what we're seeing is that the CSOs would become facilitators for the engagement with the public rather than, you know, it, that's all good that the CSOs are, you know, doing the watchdog functions and they should be doing all of, all of that, but they're also, the CSOs have to be the ones that are facilitating the engagement with the citizens and, and facilitating basically them being able to hold the governments accountable for their commitments. I'm not sure if I answered your questions, but... <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. Um, I anyway, wanted to ask you what about your understanding of participation mm -hmm. also, like of real, for re real um, participation, not only the imitation only of mm -hmm. participation that we often face. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and how would you address government's resistance to true participation? Well, I think that it's not really a matter of governments resisting to, you know, op be open for, for consultations or engagement. I think it's a lack of capacity, to be quite honest with you, because in the CSOs sector, CSOs are very often used to engaging with the public, with different stakeholders. Governments have specific functions and the, the, the ability to to, you know, to hold different uh, forums of engagement are not always within their, within their uh, let's say, expertise. So we'll, for example, another example from Kosovo is that, which is where I work the most, is that, you know, you have the, um, the um, cadaster agency, right? So very, very high expertise in their specific thematic area. But when you talk about outreach to, you know, vulnerable women, to minorities, to specific, you know, vulnerable groups, they, are, they don't have this expertise. And to be quite honest, should they be expected to have this expertise? And this is where this collaborative element with CSOs comes into the picture. So in my view, uh, we all have, you know, a role to play to making the quality of these public consultations better. Thanks a lot. Um, as we promised in the very beginning, this is a fishbowl format, and now is the time to open um, open the space and to use this free seat. So please, whoever wants to have a comment, I s saw over there the first hand, and then you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Amir Miljevic. I am coming from the Center of Sustainable Energy Transition Reset from Sarajevo. I am listening all day, you know, about stakeholder engagement and that kind of the things, and uh, I am missing the, one of the main links or players. Nobody is talking about what is the role of the parliaments in the energy transition, in the new, uh, Green New Deal, and so on and so on. The uh, reason for that is that in uh, Western Balkans, the parliaments are excluded from the process. And I don't know how we could expect that the citizens will be involved 
if their main representatives through the parliaments are not involved. This is, that's a mission impossible, really. And uh, I think that one of the uh, uh, main recommendations have to be that the parliaments have to be involved. Because all strategies which are produced on Western Balkan are adopted by the governments, and result we know. From 2006, through the energy community, we are do, uh, doing the nice strategies for everything. The result is almost zero. That means if we continue to use that approach, relation between international community and governments, without involving the parliaments, which are, as, as I know, the main driving force of the uh, energy transition and green agenda in the EU, how we could expect that we will be successful. Uh, just to give one uh, final argument for why we have to involve parliaments, uh, I could uh, not remember that there is any Green Party on the Western Balkan which are in some of the parliaments. Why? Because that's not an agenda of the parliaments. Why, why I should to establish the Green Party and to advocate for the Green Deal and the energy transition if we are not, as a guys from the parliament, involved in the process? And, and I think that's one of the uh, main uh, 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 obstacles that energy transition and uh, <coughs> Green Deal could be more successful or uh, more efficiently uh, implemented on the Western Balkan. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot for this rather pessimistic but very important assessment. Um, there was one other comment or question, um, we maybe collect some more and then we can get back. Thank you. My name is Alexander Kovacevic, I'm an energy economist and I'm all here on my own probably merit. I would like to uh, remind of something which was discussed uh, at the Berlin process in Poznań couple of years ago on the Berlin Process Conference over there. Uh, we would like, and it was said, to have a level playing field and to have a better integration of the energy from Western Balkans with EU energy markets. That includes, in my view, access to this market and also access to investment market and the leveling fair playing field. That obviously include the same rules and regulations what some of the European EU member countries energy companies have, which actually goes down to the Article 10C of the Directive 2018-410, which is amending Directive on EU ETS Directive, option for financing uh, for transitional free allocation for the modernization of the energy sector. So we have a regulation which was applied to various Central European EU member countries. And the same allocation, the same logic could be applied to Western Balkans. Western Balkan energy sector provides produces about 80 million tons of CO2 per year. That's what we are talking here about. Giving them a free allocation, what they can either consume by emit emitting these volumes, either sell and invest what some Central European countries has been doing, that will give 6 billion, listen, 6 billion euros of investment capital into the hands of people who are able to do the job. 
That is only 6% of the EU ETS market, and that economic mechanism will give, a, let's say, a better deal for European customers who are now struggling with the high electricity prices between other things because of uh, EU ETS uh, charges. So, that mechanism is also going to prompt the governments in, in uh, Western Balkans to credibly identify phase-out date for coal. Because if they have a, a mechanism which is dedicated, which is available for a period for, of 10 years, so they can plan investments, they can actually credibly undertake an obligation of the coal phase-out. That mechanism was applied successfully in the various EU member countries, and there is no reason why it cannot be applied to Western Balkans in the forthcoming 10-year period. That's enough funds to phase out coal in 10 years. There is no technical obstacle to that. The lignite came into Balkans during only 10 years, between 1976 and 1986. There is no apparent reason why it will not phase out during 10 years. And so the opportunity is there, mechanism is there, capability is there, it goes beyond the governments, well, and if EU is looking to really integrate Western Balkans into European market, here is the chance. At this moment, we have in a procedure a proposal for a new EU ETS directive, which Commission put forward in July 2021, which is in the procedure, and here is the mechanism how to do this job. Thank you, Mr. That's it. Kovacevic. So, is there more commentaries, questions from the audience so far? The, the last uh, comment would, would sound too easy, but then we have the other problem that uh, the Green Agenda is lacking political backing, as we heard from uh, Damir Miljevic. So, Rinora, would you like to, <laughs> to react on these bows? Well, um, on the ETS, uh, for sure. I mean, it's a mechanism already established. It just needs to be uh, put in place. Uh, and I don't see why Western Balkans need to opt out from uh, being part of it and benefiting from, from it because we see that decarbonization and phasing out coal is also benefiting from these mechanisms to be part of. Uh, I mean, I think it was well thought. Um, I, I don't have anything to add on that. Whereas regarding the role of parliaments, um, um, I, I totally agree. And this is definitely then linked with how we build their knowledge about their responsibility as, um, as representatives of citizens. And this needs to be done hand in hand. Uh, even citizens are requesting from them, but at the same time, them uh, knowing what they're representing. So uh, I, this is not an easy process. I don't see that as an easy process because it's not the focus there. And I said, climate change is not taking the, uh, is not yet a sexy topic apparently. I mean, it's been worse. We see some progress, but still, it's not uh, at, the, at the top of the agenda where we want to see it. Um, for sure, that then uh, should make us aware that maybe there's a need for rechanging the way we're doing things. Because apparently, we're not being terrified enough. We had uh, a session uh, in the morning where we talked about campaigns, how terrifying they should be. So maybe we're not making it uh, terrifying enough. Uh, or the greediness is higher than, than the impact. Um, and for that, there's a need for a systematic change and a thorough change from everyone not only civil society, because this is not our burden. Um, it is everybody's burden to the ones who understand it, scientists, uh, experts, civil society who uh, 
have the passion of then um, transmitting whatever uh, numbers there are and whatever um, studies there exist that common people do not understand. And yeah, maybe we need to uh, uh, translate everything into superheroes um, way or uh, however um, the citizens would understand um, the, the information. Thank you. So as, uh, as time constraints uh, make this already being the last statements uh, there, uh, Stefan Maga would like to add something and I would also ask our online uh, speakers if they want to have a last say in this round. But yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up on this role of parliaments. Um, there are a couple of things. One is, I mean, I think all I'm not, I'm not sure about all political systems in the Western Balkans, but uh, when you have parliamentarian systems where the parliament votes the government, I think it's also we need to give this a little bit back to the parliaments to ask for participation and for this influence. Uh, for instance, when budgets are assigned, why is the parliament not asking to assign budgets to uh, green investment projects or all those things? So I think the parliaments also in those countries, they have opportunities to set the topic if they would like to. And then it links directly to the question, why are there no green parties? Uh, because there is no political demand, because the, the wider society would not vote them because the green topics are not at the heart. Because the people, and this is still also the, the, the reality, face bigger challenges uh, than people in the West do in terms of coping with their no, just basic needs. And then the green topics are luxury, to say so. And I think this is a little bit the, the, the relation there. What, what I um, think is a, is a valid comment, the, the donor society is always supporting the governments and not the parliaments. And I think this also needs to be a little bit re what. Yeah. And then Alexander's uh, comment, uh, I think it's a little bit with all uh, those things also on, on the recommendations on uh, uh, regulations for renewable energies. Everything is on the table. There is nothing that needs to be newly developed. It just needs to be adapted. And then it's the question, why is it not happening? Why is it not happening? And um, including um, the, the, um, the Western Balkan countries in the European emission trading scheme, if there would be also the sufficient political will on European side, it could be easily done, as, as Alexander described. So I hope the pol Berlin process is really delivering uh, some more concrete ways forward and then really pushing all stakeholders on both sides, because it's not just the Western Balkans, it's also the EU uh, politicians in the EU that have their stake in why things don't move forward. Thank you. So is there any, any other comment from our uh, panelists online or in the room? Yeah, so let's conclude then this panel. Um, um, as, we, as we've heard uh, several times today, so there can't be a green deal for European Union without the Western Balkans and their green agenda. Um, searching the uniting so applies very much for Western Balkan countries. I mean, civil society-wise as also respectively for their governments. And um, yeah, as we have also heard from different perspectives, like knowledge and understanding is, is key, vice versa. So thanks a lot. And uh, yeah. <laughs>